America faces a lot of enemies right now, foreign and domestic, but from the perspective of the people who run the country, there's really just one enemy, and that's faithful Christians. Now, nobody ever says that out loud, of course. Nobody ever says anything very meaningful out loud in the United States anymore. But if you're interested in who they really hate, well, look at what's happening. So Christian churches across the country have been burning, and no one in the government is doing anything about it. Look at how Christian churches are treated during COVID. Strip clubs stayed open, weed dispensaries stayed open, liquor stores stayed open, but Christian churches were closed because public health. We talked the other day to a guy who's facing 11 years in prison, federal felony charges from the Biden administration for praying at an abortion clinic and daring to sing hymns. So if you are a faithful Christian, not a fake Christian, David French Christian, but an actual Christian, of the kind this country has always had, of the kind this country was created to harbor, actually, uh, you are seen as an enemy by the people who run it. And of course, nobody hates Christians more than longtime Hollywood actor and producer Rob Reiner, <laughs> amazingly. And he's just produced a documentary about how faithful Christians are the enemy, if you can believe it. Here's the trailer from that documentary. We should be blazing forth as a countercultural example, and instead, we're leading the charge of malice and division. Christian nationalism uses Christianity as a means to an end, that end being some form of authoritarianism. Being a Christian is about the values of inclusion. Christian nationalism is certainly not based on the values of the gospel. God wants America to be saved. They're told over and over and over again that you're in danger. You need to fight if you don't want to lose your country. We are in a civil war between good and evil. This is not a movement about Christian values. This is about Christian power. The thing that keeps me up at night is that we lose democracy. Does that seem possible? Yes. <laughs> Rob Reiner lecturing us on what Jesus really wanted. Now, part of the purpose of this is political, of course. Part of the purpose, maybe the main purpose, is spiritual. There's something about actual Christianity that's the greatest threat of all to the people in charge. And again, you see it all around. MSNBC the other day hosted a Politico reporter, Heidi Prisbala, attacking Christians who somehow got the idea, maybe from our founding documents, that their rights come from God and aren't granted out of the generosity of, say, Kamala Harris's heart. Here's Heidi Prisbala. And the one thing that unites all of them, because there's many different groups orbiting Trump, but the thing that unites them as Christian nationalists, not Christians, by the way, because Christian nationalists is very different, mm -hmm. is that they believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. <laughs> they think their rights come from God. They're not granted by the U.S. Congress and Politico and Heidi Prisbala who, by the way, has no idea what she's saying, just another useful idiot. Um, but what's going on behind the scenes, all the effort that went into getting Heidi Prisbala to carry this message, probably unknowingly, is worth taking a really close look at. In fact, it's really the only conversation that matters at this point in the history of the West. And Megan Basham has been covering this and writing about it from a position of deep knowledge and we think some wisdom. She's a reporter for the Daily Wire. She's written a book about this. She joins us now. Uh, Megan, thanks so much for coming on. So this is a much broader conversation, but let's just start with uh, Rob Reiner lecturing the rest of us about what Christianity really is. What is this documentary and what's the purpose of it? Yeah, it's a little hard to get around the irony of that. And thanks for having me, Tucker. Um, you know, to start with, I might disagree with a, a little bit something you said in your monologue there. Of course. And that is that they're not saying this out loud because they're very much saying it out loud these days. Um, they are calling evangelicals, particularly evangelicals, who engage in the political process a threat to democracy. And I think that's the important thing to know because the context of this, and for people who don't know what evangelicals are or why we should care, if you're not a particularly religious person, here's why you care. So they are 32% of the American electorate. Um, the Atlantic quite rightly called them in 2021, America's most powerful voting bloc. So they're right about that. They are essentially the only obstacle that we still have 
to the left-wing agenda. If you remove them, you removed all the breaks, is essentially what evangelicals are and what they do when it comes to uh, the political process. So there's been a very deliberate effort, and this film is part of it, but it is just a drop in the bucket, to be quite frank, um, of an entire cottage industry that is saying, if these people, these evangelicals, continue to engage in the uh, public process to try to influence their neighbors through their vote, uh, through free association, through using their free speech by, you know, get out the vote efforts, anything like that, that's dangerous and scary. And that's very much what you saw with this film. So, I mean, it is over the top. I, I'm not going to do it the justice of pretending like it presents anything like a coherent intellectual argument. It doesn't. Uh, what it essentially does is say, here are bad, scary Christians. And they include in that bucket, by the way, everyone from Billy Graham to Mike Pence to um, the Unite the Right rally, which was led by Richard Spencer, an atheist. So it's essentially saying all these guys, Jerry Falwell, John MacArthur, all of them, they're the same as Unite the Right, which in itself is bonkers to even try to create a parallel there. Um, so that Wait, is so the, they, the I'm sorry to interrupt. The they, they claim, and I haven't, I haven't seen mm -hmm. it, um, but there's, Richard Spencer is a liberal who hates Christianity, and they're saying that Richard Spencer Correct. is a Christian nationalist? Correct. Yes. So, uh, you know, as they sort of trace the arc of Christian nationalism in American history, uh, what they show is that it culminates in the Unite the Right rally and the January 6th riot, uh, neither of which has there ever been any evidence were associated with any religious motives. So really what you could call this is a propaganda smear. That's what it is. It's just one that's being helped along by people who uh, claim to be speaking for the real Christians, the true Christians, which in this film are the Christians who are pro-abortion, uh, pro-LGBTQ agenda, who, you know, demand uh, political action on behalf of abortion in their rainbow drenched churches. I mean, I'm, I'm hardly a theologian, have no interest in becoming one, uh, but I think we can say conclusively, if you're pro-abortion, you're not a Christian. I mean, I think it's kind of that simple, is it not? I, I don't know how you could be for child sacrifice <laughs> and for Christianity. Right, yeah, it absolutely is for me. And, you know, that's part of what's so insidious is, you know, they 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 say that Roe is the, the overturning of Roe was the culmination of Christian nationalist uh, political victory. So if you're going to do that, you have now just said that evangelicals participating in the uh, political process over a course of, gosh, 30, 50 years that put in so much effort that that was nothing more than a political ploy. And it's not true Christianity. It's not true religion. In fact, they say that the only reason Christians and evangelicals in particular picked up that issue was because they failed at blocking uh, desegregation in private schools back in the 1960s. So um, that's how unserious this film is. But what is serious about it is that it's part of a much larger narrative that we're seeing. Um, you know, everybody knows Rob Reiner, so everybody's talking about this particular film. But let's get real. I mean, there's been an entire cottage industry of books from, you know, staff writers at The Atlantic through uh, from Russell Moore, who is in this film himself, uh, claiming to speak for um, the sober minded, non politically idolatrous Christians, which, you know, that in itself, given how political someone like Russell Moore, who is the editor of Christianity Today himself is, is hugely ironic. And I, I think that there's also a little bit of um, don't look behind the curtain at what the man back there is doing, because Russell Moore is absolutely a political actor in a much more deliberate and well-funded way than, you know, any of the people that this movie is criticizing. Well, let's 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 talk about that. I mean, so he was a Baptist leader, of course, for years. He didn't like Trump, mm -hmm. which in, from my perspective, is totally fine. You don't have to like Trump to be a Christian, of course. Uh, or any political leader. Um, but Russell Moore is himself a political leader. And he does, it seems from my outsider's perspective, very much like he is paid to subvert American traditional Christianity on behalf of the Democratic Party. He seems like he's betraying his fellow Christians um, for money. But I, maybe I'm just being unfair. You tell me who Russell Moore is, if you would, who who's backing him and why, you think? So if you're not familiar with Russell Moore, um, he was formerly, until the last few years, uh, the head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. And that mm -hmm. is the political lobbying arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. That is the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. 
It represents uh, some 47,000 churches, maybe 15 million evangelicals in the country. So if your purpose is to suppress or sway their vote, you're not going to get more bang for your buck than trying to uh, infiltrate the Southern Baptist Convention. And I think yes. that's very much what we have seen with Russell Moore when he was in leadership. Um, you know, part of the thing that he did was getting the ERLC involved with a group called the Evangelical Immigration Table, which is essentially just the faith front of the National Immigration Forum, which is a left wing NGO that advocates for um, open border policies, amnesty policies. They are George Soros funded. They don't like people to talk about that, but they absolutely are. And so these are the kind of things that Russell Moore was involved in, involved in when he was with the ERLC. Um, you know, he did a lot of uh, publicity with Obama, trying to convince um, all kinds of, you know, conservative legislators at the time that evangelicals backed uh, amnesty policies and that that's what they wanted. And he's still doing that kind of thing today. But eventually it was sort of like the jig was up with Southern Baptists. You had the rank and file who did not feel represented by him, um, really dissatisfied with the kind of political lobbying that he was doing. So you know, he said he was psychologically terrorized. Now, he has never defined what he meant by he was psychologically terrorized. He by said that, Southern that he Baptists was psychologically like terrorized? Yes, he said that. He oh. said he was psychologically terrorized by the Southern Baptists who were not fans of his. Um, and again, and this was repeated in Atlantic writer Tim Alberta's book, but nobody ever defines what he meant by that. Everybody just sort of takes him at his word. Um, so I don't know what he meant by that. But what we do know is the rank and file did not really like his political views. So he left and he went and became the editor in chief at Christianity Today. And what they're doing in this cycle right now, for example, is um, they have launched a, a, a curriculum that is a political Bible study to help Christians reframe their political identity. Um, and it's funded by people like the Rockefellers, the uh, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. If you're not familiar with them, they fund a lot of left wing things uh, like abortion and quote unquote, gender affirming care for minors and youth. So puberty blockers, uh, mastectomies for young girls, hormones, all of that. So things that rob children of their sexual function. Um, so he's, he's, he's involved with a group that's taking money from them and also from the Hewlett Foundation, which is the largest, uh, fund, second largest funder, excuse me, of Planned Parenthood. So they have created this Bible study to go into churches, to go into, uh, Christian colleges, universities. Um, the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities has been pushing it onto all of their 185 campuses. And essentially what it does is say that issues are complex. And at the beginning of this, you brought up abortion, Tucker. And one of the things that this curriculum stresses is that if anybody tells you they think they know the answer on how you should vote for uh, when it comes to abortion and protecting innocent lives, you should run from that person because you shouldn't buy into package deal ethics. Um, and it is, it, it's insidious, but it is somewhat overt in this curriculum. Um, at one point, David French, who is also involved in this curriculum, is talking about how complex the issue of abortion is, and we don't always know how we should vote regarding it. Um, they show on the screen a woman holding up a pro-life sign at a march. So, you know, the visual messaging there is very clear. So when you look at this, you go, here you have guys like Russell Moore, David French, who are taking money from hard left secular foundations to push their political curriculum into churches onto Christian campuses. This is explicitly political lobbying. And yet at the same time, they're in this movie of Rob Reiner's warning, oh gosh, look at all the idolatrous Trump voters, all of the idolatrous evangelicals who are trying to oppose Roe, who are happy about the Dobbs decision, who made political choices to bring that day about. So, you know, there's just a huge irony there, or we might call it hypocrisy and Phariseeism. Well, I do, I do think that there's a different standard for leaders. I mean, they, they have the privilege of leadership and all of its many benefits, but they mm. also have deeper obligations to the people they lead. And I wonder of those, of, of the people you've mentioned, David French and Russell Moore, there have been a lot of killing of Christians around the world. There's killing of Christians in Gaza right now, killing Christians in Armenia. The Christians of Iraq were genocided under George W. Bush. Um, and then there are Christians in the United States going to prison for practicing their religion. Have they said anything about any of that? 
No. And, you know, that's part of what this is, is that they they push forward a message of here is what faithful Christian witness in the public square looks like. But it's only on specific issues. Right. It's only on things like welcoming the stranger when it comes to illegal immigration. So, you know, that's a big messaging push that Russell Russell Moore, uh, David French have been involved in. Um, it includes things like uh, not idolizing Trump. But when it comes to these complex issues that we should be talking about from a biblical worldview, they don't delve into that at all because that is not part of the messaging that, um, let's say, the mainstream media, let's say the secular progressive foundations who are funding their ventures. These are not the political ideas that they're interested in. It's not the political debate that they're interested in. And, you know, therefore, they don't talk about that. And you're not going to hear them talk about that. And look, I think these are issues on which Christians of good faith can have different views. And it's yes. something that we can wrestle with and discuss. But what you notice is they don't wrestle with it and discuss it. They That's say, right. you know, there is one legitimate Christian outlook to take. And if you express or even ask in any way about it in in, in any curious or you present something else that may go, hey, what about this? I, I just read about these, you know, Ukrainian churches that are being shut down. I, I have a concern <laughs> about that. The immediate thing is to tag you as somebody who is a Christian nationalist, who's a conspiracy theorist. And, you know, one thing that made me laugh in this film uh, when they were tying January 6th to Christian nationalism is they said, one of the dangers we may see coming out of this is that Christians may begin to second guess what happened on January 6th, and that would be a threat to our democracy. So things that should be <laughs> um, the foundations of our democracy open debate about these issues, about like what's happening in Ukraine or, you know, what's happening in Gaza or any of these subjects where we should have free and open debate. Instead, they're saying it's a threat to democracy to have free and open debate as Christians about these issues. You you must obey and not question people who hate Christianity and want to kill Christians. Otherwise, you're not a Christian. That's that's what they're saying. One of the things that bothers me that most <laughs> about all of this and shocks me a little bit is if you live in a pluralistic society like ours, which is great. Um, one of the rules is you can't attack other people's religions. And and I you may disagree with them. I disagree with a lot of different religions. But if you want to all live together, you can't just attack the theological precepts of other people's religions or else people really start to hate each other and it's impossible to live together. And yet these attacks on Christian nationalism are exactly that. Does anyone see that as unwise? Like, let's not do this. I mean, you know, certainly you're seeing rank and file people saying this is unwise and you are starting to see something of a, OK, I, and we can debate whether or not this is wise. But you're seeing some people going, we are getting tagged with this Christian nationalism label anyway. So maybe what we should do is just accept it and, you know, give it a definition that is different from the definition that they're going to give it since they're going to push this agenda anyway. Um, and here's the situation is that we see where this spins out. We we see what happens in societies where we've made it okay for the government to start investigating churches, starting to question people's doctrine and theology. And that actually is a dangerous road to go down. Um, and that's not something that they grapple with at all in this film. It's certainly not something that, you know, the public theologian of Christianity today, which is the flagship magazine of evangelicalism and should be grappling with issue, this issue, that's not something that they discuss at all. And, you know, you, you don't want to scaremonger, but at the same time, you go, I can see very clearly the direction it goes in when we have our DOJ investigating Catholic churches as hotbeds of domestic terrorism. That is not a good place for us to head down. And so this entire narrative is setting something like that up. And if we're going to do that, you do get to the place where you go, these are legitimate religions and these are not legitimate religions. And that actually is something that foundationally uh, our founding father said, no, that's not what this country is about. You have freedom to practice your religion and the state is not going to tell you whether you have a legitimate interpretation of you know biblical writings or not. Well, that's exactly right. And if we're already there, I mean, they're sending Biden DOJ sending a man to prison for 11 years for praying in an abortion clinic. So, you know, if that doesn't bother you as a defender of democracy and freedom of religion, I mean, you're obviously on the side of totalitarianism and, and they are. So last question, is it working? I mean, the whole idea is to take sincere, faithful Christians and make them abandon sincere, faithful Christianity and turn to the left. That's that's the point of this. Is that working? 
Yeah, I think it has been a very effective gambit. So, you know, when you look at it as this two-pronged approach, you have one where people who genuinely sincere Christians might hear, oh gosh, I'm not loving my neighbor if I am very clear about my views in the public square and that the way of Jesus is to be somewhat ashamed and quiet of what our biblical convictions are and we shouldn't exercise our constitutional rights in the same way that all of our neighbors do. I, I think that absolutely is having an effect, particularly with, you might say, younger evangelicals. Um, they might feel a little embarrassed, like maybe, you know, it's it's not such a good thing to be so bold and so outspoken about what we think about the cause of life. And then on the other hand, I do think you absolutely have people who are a little bit nervous of where this is heading as far as, you know, how our government is talking about Christians now. Um, how you see some very powerful actors saying, I, I don't want to be viewed as a threat to democracy. So, um, I'm just not going to, you know, participate in this, you know, voter mobilization effort. Um, I'm not going to do things like question January 6th because I don't want to be lumped in with the people who are viewed as a threat to democracy. And that becomes a problem because there's a, a tacit threat there that if you question anything outside of the you know official narrative, you're now a threat to democracy. Yeah, no, that's totally right. I mean, I said that was my last question, but I do have one more, which is if, mm. if we accept, I, you've made a very powerful case and I, I believe it, that the leadership of a lot of these Christian institutions is totally, totally corrupt and actually working against uh, their flocks, their members. But who, I mean, who are the leaders that you that you listen to? You know, maybe, the, and I'm not even asking this in political terms, who they vote for is, you know, not as relevant as whether they're clear thinking and honest about the religion. So who who is resisting these attempts at subversion, do you think? Well, look, and that's a really good part of this conversation is that you're seeing, I would say, a new generation of young pastors, young theologians, young thinkers, you know, look, guys who are um, a lot more uh, educated and intelligent about the theological debate around these issues than I am. But I read them and I love them. Um, you know, guys like Doug Wilson are doing Pastor Doug yes. Wilson doing really fascinating work. Um, you're seeing old guard guys like Pastor John MacArthur out of um, California who fought the uh, COVID clo uh, closure mandates and guys like that who never wavered and they never got sucked into all of this. And, you know, in all of my research for this book, these are the guys that I went, I never saw any money being funneled to them. And so right. it's sure funny how they never picked up any of this messaging. <laughs> um, so I am seeing that. I'm also seeing young guys within the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, look, there, there's a People won't know this. This is very granular, but there is a soul for that massive uh, battle for the soul of that massive Southern Baptist Convention right now that is happening. And that's actually very good news to me, because what that means is that, you know, it, it is not beyond saving and, and it matters because its seminaries educate um, the majority of pastors of all denominations in this country. So it's really important uh, what happens with the Southern Baptist Convention and what happens with its seminaries. And you are seeing a group of, um, I would say, aggressive, unashamed Christian young guys who are now challenging the old guard leadership saying, we do not want to see our convention go in that direction. Um, so that's the good news is that, you know, they, they are mounting a resistance, I would say, but there needs to be more of that. And there needs to be more people who are I guess I would say willing to take on the mantle of leadership, that you cannot just sit in the pews and be upset about what you see happening in some of these ministries. Um, we need some guys who are going to step up and, and take the reins. Amen. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. It's absolutely fascinating. And before we go, what's it, tell us the name of your book once more. Yes. So it's uh, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda. And, you know, I just barely touched on a little bit of the information about the Soros funding, the Rockefeller funding, the Clinton funding, <laughs> and all of it going to um, create these faith front groups that create astroturf campaigns to try to convince Christians that um, the, the biblical thing to do is support the party of abortion and the LGBTQ agenda. So uh, try to wrap your head around that. But that's what these groups are doing. Yeah. Well, there's a lot at stake. You can't overstate that. So, Megan Basham, appreciate your coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Free speech is bigger than any one person or any one organization. Societies are defined by what they will not permit. What we're watching is the total inversion of virtue.
Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. The internet is crowded with interesting things that don't really matter. On TCN, we attempt to bring you interesting things that actually do matter, and a lot of them. Interviews, long form and short, videos, documentaries. You can find all of it on TuckerCarlson.com, and we hope you will.